All right, good morning, y'all. Sorry for the delay. It looks like the person teaching before me was giving an exam. So thank you all for your patience. We'll go ahead, and go ahead and get started in just a minute here. Before we do, I just have a couple of announcements about some things coming up. I keep mentioning this survey that I'm going to send out about your COM 110 lecture and lab instruction. I keep postponing it because we keep having class canceled, but it is coming. I'll let you know when it's coming, and you'll have a couple days to take care of that. That one is required. It's going to come to you by way of Qualtrics. I'll send you an email link, and you can just take the link, uh, click on the link, and fill out the survey. It's helpful for me and for your lab instructors so that we can adjust things for you and give you better instruction in the second half of the semester. I like to say that we're not mind readers, hard as we try. And so it's an opportunity for you to tell us some things that we're doing well, some things that you might want us to do differently. And that way, we can hopefully be on the same page going forward for the rest of the semester. The second thing I wanted to tell you about is there's another survey that you can fill out. This one is not directly related to COM 110, but it will impact your grade if you decide to do it. There is an extra credit uh, study that my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Shu, is putting out. That study is about public perceptions around drone technology, and so he is working to get people's perceptions on that. That study is available up to, uh, until, I think, Friday on uh, Sona Systems. So you should have received an email about that. If you haven't, I can put you in touch with our SONA director. If you participate in the drone surveys, those are worth up to 15 points of extra credit, or 1.5% of your final grade. I've told your lab instructors that extra credit for this class is capped at 20 points, or 2%. So that'll take care of most of your extra credit for the semester if you decide to do that. He's hoping to get some participants for his study. It would be really helpful for him. Obviously, if you participate in that study, your responses will be kept anonymous. It's just a good opportunity for you. So with those in mind, we're going to go ahead and move forward. We're going to extend our lesson from last week on audience analysis and talk a little bit about listening and criticism. I mentioned in last week's lesson that a lot of uh, people ex approach public speaking from the perspective of, I'm the speaker. What do I need to do in order to get myself ready? And they're a little bit self-centered in that, not in the narcissistic way. But really, they approach speech trying to figure out how they make sure their bases are covered. Whereas uh, the goal of speech, a lot of the time, is to try and teach your audience things they didn't already know, maybe to try and change their perspectives on different things. And so I want to get you out of that mindset of just approaching your speech from a speaker-oriented perspective. I also want to train you all to become good audience members for your classmates and for other speakers who you'll hear later on in your life. Uh, another reason why I'm teaching you a little bit about uh, listening and criticism is because we all have things that we can learn from hearing other people speak. And so you all will have some opportunities in this class to watch other people's speeches and maybe try to figure out what are some things you want to emulate about how they speak, what are some things that they do that maybe you want to avoid. So we're going to spend today talking about listening and criticism. I want to start off by talking to you about different kinds of listening. Uh, listening is one of those things that's generally very important. A lot of communication literature, a lot of psychology literature says that listening is one of the most important parts of your relationships with other people. Listening is also very hard to do and especially hard to do well. Part of the reason for that is because there's different kinds of listening that we're engaged in. It's not just that there's one kind of listening that we all do and we just sit and listen with our ears. Our brain is actually doing different things depending on what we're hoping to get out of the experience. So I'm going to walk you through four types of listening. These are coming from another public speaking textbook. And the first type is what we call appreciative listening. This is what you're doing most of the time when you are seeking out entertainment. So if you're listening to music, if you're watching television, your, your goal here is to appreciate. I mentioned that when speakers give speeches, in order to get to their thesis, their thesis statement, they usually have a general purpose, and then they narrow that down into a specific purpose. When you're listening, we have specific purposes as well. And so the first one is to listen just for pure enjoyment for entertainment, for pleasure. That's different from empathic listening. This, empathic listening is the kind of listening that you do when you're trying to give someone emotional support. So maybe you know somebody who recently broke up with their significant other. Or maybe they lost a friend or a family member. And so you're there to listen. You're there to let them know that you care about them. That's a deeper kind of listening than just listening for the sake of enjoying something. And it's listening that's involved in treating other people as human beings. A third type of listening that we have is what we call comprehensive listening. At the root of this is the word comprehend. Your goal in comprehensive listening is to try and learn something new. So all of you who are taking notes right now 
are engaging in comprehensive listening, you're trying to understand something, you're using a lot more of the cognitive side of your brain, whereas empathic listening is using more of the emotional side of your brain. So comprehensive listening is listening and trying to take notes. It's very closely tied to that fourth canon of memory. And you want to make sure that when you're doing comprehensive listening that you're paying very close attention. It's very easy to get distracted. And we're going to talk in a minute about why it is that it's easy to get distracted. The fourth type of listening that you'll engage in is what they call critical listening. And critical listening is not listening for the sake of pointing out everybody's problems, but listening instead to determine whether you agree or disagree with a particular message. And so if you're engaged in critical listening, you're probably engaged in someone trying to persuade you. And you may or may not already agree with that person, and based on what they say and how they say it, you'll determine whether you, whether you like their message or dislike their message. Now, all of these use different parts of your brain, and as public speaking audience members, you're probably going to engage in all four of these at any given time. And sometimes you might be involved in more than one at a time. For instance, when you get to your deliberations at the end of the semester, you're probably going to be doing a lot of comprehensive listening and critical listening at the same time. And so you want to be aware of what parts of your brain are being activated when you do those things. And also to recognize that you have different purposes and there's different things that you can take away as an audience member. So you want to be familiar with those different types of listening, but you also want to be familiar with some problems that can come up with listening. We're going to get to those problems in a minute here, but what, I'm, what we're really talking about today is if you all covered the communication model last week, a lot of what we've talked about up until this point in the semester has been on the source side of things. The source uh, encodes a message. They send that message through a channel. Ideally, that channel gets to the receiver, and both the source and the receiver have the exact same message. So this is what Shannon and Weaver proposed as their ideal model of communication. When communication goes right, it follows that middle pathway through that cloud there, the source, message, channel, and receiver, and everything goes according to plan. When that's not always the case, there's two other parts of this that are kind of receiver-oriented, and that's where we're going to spend our energy today. The first is what's called noise or interference. And noise or interference can be physical noises if there's construction happening outside, if people are talking or shuffling their feet or packing up at the end of a class. It's going to be hard for you to hear a message. And so interference is anything that can distract you. Interference or noise can sometimes be in internal as well. It's not always external noise of somebody coughing, but it can be internal noise of you're distracted by what you want to eat for lunch. You're distracted by a fight you had last night or this morning with somebody you care about. Those are all things that can distract you and get in the way of that, that message passing from the source to you. The other part of uh, listening and criticism that we're going to be dealing with today is feedback. So feedback is really where criticism comes in. Feedback is your chance as the receiver of a message to become the source of a new message. So most of the time when we have the communication model, it's a one-way transaction from the source to the receiver. Feedback is an opportunity for you as the receiver to let the, audience, or let the speaker know what you think of their speech. And so you're going to be engaging in that. In order to give good feedback, you have to pay pretty close attention. You have to be able to know what you want to say and how you want to say it. You also want to think critically about how you pass on that message. If you have to say some things that the speaker is probably not going to like, you probably want to be careful when you're giving that feedback. Now, there's a lot of reasons why we are not particularly good at listening. A lot of people really struggle to listen, and a lot of people have misconceptions about why that is. So we're going to talk about some of those misconceptions here. I've pulled up a picture of Ralph Wiggum from The Simpsons. There's an episode of The Simpsons where his father is sending him away on a bus, and he's going away to some kind of summer camp, and he says, now Ralphie. If your nose starts bleeding, it means you're picking it too much or not enough. That's sort of similar to how we handle listening. A lot of people will listen a little bit too hard. A lot of people will listen not hard enough. It is actually possible, believe it or not, to listen too hard to a speaker's message. This often happens when people will try to get everything down word for word. A lot of you who are taking notes right now might be recording every single word I say, including my verbal fillers. And you might find that if you try and record every single word that you can, you're not going to be able to get the entire message. And your brain is going to be playing catch up trying to get the whole message on your paper. 
So what I recommend for you is to think back to how we talked about preparation outlines and speaking outlines. It's very similar to note-taking format. A lot of people will try to take notes word for word or try and get as much written on a page as possible. It's actually much better if you think about your notes and your listening as more of a speaking outline. That is, if the preparation outline is the full text of the speech word for word, you're probably not going to be able to get that down all at once. But if you take notes in like shorthand format, in keywords, and you go idea by idea, not only do you retain more information that way, but it's easier for you to remember it not just from your notes, but in your head. You'll be able to walk through that sequence of ideas, kind of like when Joshua Foer talked about his memory palace. It's also quite possible to listen not hard enough. So we talked about noise or interference as distractions that can come up and ways that you can not listen all that carefully. Situational audience analysis is what we talked about last week as what speakers do whenever they are in the room actually giving their speech. They're watching to see if audience members are paying attention. They're aware of the temperature in the room. They're aware of how people are feeling. They're aware of contextual factors. And they're analyzing the room in the moment in order to try and make their speech as effective as they possibly can. Another way that people listen not hard enough has to do with our speaking rate and our processing rate. So our speaking rate is how many words per minute we can say when we talk. Our processing rate is how many words we can understand when we listen. Raise your hand if you think our speaking rate is faster than our processing rate. Raise your hand if you think our processing rate is faster than our speaking rate. Okay, I'm seeing about a third of you on each of those, which means a third of you probably aren't sure, just don't want to raise your hands, that's okay. A lot of people think that our speaking rate is faster than our processing rate, and that if a speaker talks too fast, that's why I have a hard time listening. And so I've been told this on some of my teaching evals in the past, I naturally have kind of a faster rhythm to my voice, and some of my students have told me to slow down, so I've spent the last seven or eight years consciously trying to slow down my speech when I teach. The average speaking rate is about 120 to 150 words per minute. So that's not a whole lot. That's maybe two or three words per second. That's not a whole lot that we can say. And I'll tell you that when I was an undergrad, we had an exercise where we timed out our own average speaking rate. And we would read a paragraph, kind of like when you did speech and hearing testing. And we would count how many words were in that paragraph and how long it took us to say that. And I'll tell you, I was on the faster end at the time. I was at about 180 words per minute. So the average is about 135. People can go up to maybe 210, 220. People can speak much slower than that, obviously, as well. So a lot of people think that if you talk really fast, and, or if someone talks really fast and you're trying to listen to that person, it's going to be hard to understand them if they talk too fast. There are actual studies that will test our processing rate as well, and they put our processing rate at about 400 to 800 words per minute. That's a lot faster than a speaking rate of 120 to 150 words per minute. And if you don't believe me on this, what you can do is actually go to YouTube. You can watch any video on YouTube where someone's talking at a normal speaking rate, so maybe a TED Talk. And if you want to watch that video, there's a setting on YouTube where you can put it on time and a half, or you can put it on double speed. And you'll be surprised that even on double speed, if that person's talking at, say, 140 words per minute, you can process them at 280 words per minute or more. The reason why we're not listening hard enough doesn't have to do with how fast people are talking, but it has to do with other things that get in the way. If our speaking rate is slower than our processing, our processing rate, our brain gets distracted and finds other things to fill it in with. And so there's lots of distractions that can fill in that remaining time, and you want to make sure that you're giving that speaker your full undivided attention. There's a couple of other obstacles to listening that come up, and one of them is jumping to conclusions. A lot of people will have preconceived notions about the speaker, preconceived notions about the topic. Maybe you're required to listen to something and you don't want to be there. Or maybe you've heard that person speak before and you don't like them, or you see the title of their presentation and you decide, well, there's nothing in that that's of value to me, or I disagree with their conclusion, so I'm just going to tune this one out. A lot of people will jump to conclusions, and maybe even halfway through their speech, they'll say, okay, this hasn't been the best speech for the first half. I'm just going to tune out the second half. And then three quarters of the way through the speech, it gets much better, and they find themselves missing important content. So you want to make sure that you don't prejudge the root of prejudice, various speakers, based on who they are, or what they're talking about, or what their position happens to be. 
Last but not least, another one of those distractions that can fill in the gap between our speaking rate and our processing rate is getting caught up on a speaker's appearance or on their gestures or their verbal or nonverbal delivery. So I've had pretty much every female colleague that I've ever worked with tell me that someone in their student evaluations has made a comment on how they dress regardless of whether that's appropriate as a way of evaluating their teaching. You dress too formally. You dress too informally. I don't like it. It's distracting, whatever it happens to be. I have never once in my teaching evaluations had a student say, I don't like the way Dr. Serber dresses. This is about as formal as I get, but there were times when I was a graduate student where I would teach in gym shorts and t-shirt in the summertime, and I never had a problem with that. So we have some gendered expectations, and a lot of people get distracted based on how you dress. This is why some of your lab instructors will insist that you dress up for speech day. I'm not one of those lab instructors who does that. I like to have you dressed in what you're most comfortable in, but it can help your appearance. It can help your ethos if you want to get a little bit more formal. But as a listener, you also want to be aware of the ways that you can get distracted by somebody gesturing too much, somebody gesturing not enough, somebody's rhythm and cadence in their voices, somebody's tone of voice or their pitch. There's lots of different ways we can get distracted and not really focus on the message, but instead focus on the speaker. I like to think that both speakers and listeners have ethics associated with them. So to sum up some of the problems of listening, I think there's some things that, some key principles that you want to be aware of if you're going to be a good audience member. The first one is recognize that listening is hard and especially active listening is hard. There's a difference between just hearing things and having them go in one ear and out the other versus actively paying attention and staying focused and paying close attention to the message. I want you to give your speakers full undivided attention. I like to say that the golden rule applies when we are listening. So you want to treat your speakers the way that you would want to be treated if you were speaking. Maybe not everyone in the room finds your topic super exciting. Maybe not everybody in the room agrees with you. You nevertheless would want respect, and so you should give that same respect to your classmates or to your instructors or to whoever you're listening to. The second thing has to do with not jumping to conclusions, and that's just suspending judgment. If you know in advance that you don't really like the speaker, you don't really like the topic, you don't really like their position on the topic, nevertheless, put that stuff aside. Sometimes you'll be surprised by some of the things that you learn. I often talk about my public speaking classroom as a judgment-free zone, where there will be times when speakers will embarrass themselves, there will be times when instructors will embarrass themselves, and that's okay. I want you to recognize that public speaking is hard for a lot of people, so you want to start off by not being judgmental. I think a lot of college students are afraid of being judged by their peers. The third thing that you want to make sure that you do is to give people free expression. Even if they're talking about a topic that you don't like, even if you disagree with them, there's a trend on college campuses to interrupt speakers or to be judgmental or to walk out of speeches. I'll tell you that even in my public speaking classroom, as hard as I try to fight it, I've actually had students try to sabotage other people's speeches by making faces at them or by talking in the middle of their speeches. That's not appropriate. Obviously, you all know that. I trust that you all are smarter than that and kinder than that. But you want to make sure that you allow people the freedom to say what they want to say. We live in a country with strong First Amendment protections. You all have freedom of speech. That should apply in the classroom. That should apply outside of the classroom. We're going to talk a little bit more about that next week. Now, so we talked about listening. We talked about some of the challenges of listening. I want to move then to criticism. So we have listening for the sake of comprehension or for the sake of deciding whether we agree or disagree with a speaker's message. We also have listening for the sake of speech criticism. Speech criticism is a subset of the area of communication that I'm trained in, of rhetoric. We'll talk at the end of the semester of the history of how public speaking de uh, developed in the United States. Rhetoric is the study of speech and other acts of communication and how they shape our reality. Rhetorical criticism is a subset of rhetoric that looks at particular texts and analyzes how they operate in context. How well did that speech accomplish its goals? Last week, you all should have learned a little bit about the rhetorical situation in your classes. So you have an exigence. That's your reason for giving the speech in the first place. You have an audience who can do something to modify that exigence. And then you have constraints, things that the speaker can or can't control. When we're talking about criticism, we're looking for a fitting response. That is, how well did the speaker adapt to that rhetorical situation? 
So when we're talking about criticism, a lot of people think that criticism is just pointing out the flaws in everybody else's speech. What are all the things that they did wrong? If they got a C, why didn't they get a B or an A? That's not really what we're talking about with criticism. What we're talking about is more in line with what we would call critical thinking. When we're doing speech criticism, what we're doing is listening to other people's speeches for the sake of trying to understand how well the speaker accomplished their goals, but also to learn a little bit more about kind of the kinds of speeches we would give. If we were to give that same speech, how might we do it better? If there's something that that speaker did that we liked and we don't know how to do it yet, what can we learn from how they did it? So speech criticism is the kind of criticism that's holistic. It's looking at not just the bad things that the speaker did wrong, but also looking for things that the speaker did well and some things that the speaker might have done a little bit differently. The goal here is to do constructive criticism. So it's being holistic. It's not just focusing on the one part of the speech that you were really excited about or the one part of the speech that you really hated, but thinking critically about all the different parts of the speech that the speaker had to do to construct the speech and deliver it. So you're probably going to want to be thinking in terms of not just one canon, I really liked or I really hated your delivery, but instead looking at invention, arrangement, and style and memory as well. Now there's a couple different ways that you all will be able to engage in speech criticism in this class. A lot of you in your lab sections this week will have a speech criticism assignment. That assignment's gonna ask you to find a speech, a lesser known speech that you can analyze. So I don't want 50 different analyses of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Most of us are familiar with that. Most of us could probably criticize that speech and say what's good about it, what's not so good about it. What I want you to do is to find a speech that maybe people don't know about, maybe one that you're particularly excited about, ideally one that you haven't learned before. So maybe you go and watch a TED Talk that you haven't seen. Maybe you go to the website American Rhetoric. It has a whole bunch of speeches throughout history in the United States and important speeches that uh, key figures have given. Whatever it happens to be, I want you to watch someone else's speech so that you can analyze what are some things that that speaker is doing well, what are some things that that speaker is not doing so well. If I were to emulate this speech, what would I get out of it? The other way that this manifests in this class is through peer and self-evaluations. I told you all on the first day of class, you all are going to have opportunities to record yourselves speaking. And I think that's one of the most important exercises that you can do in a public speaking class. The reason for that is because oftentimes we don't get to see what our speech looks like from other people's perspectives. We only know the version of our speech as we remember it from how we delivered it. I know a lot of you probably don't like hearing your voices or watching yourself on video. I will tell you that when I took public speaking, that was the single most important and most helpful exercise that we did. So you all are going to be watching your own speeches and trying to evaluate what you thought you did well, what you think you can work on for the next one. Every time you speak, you're also going to have peer evaluations. Some of those peer evaluations will come in the form of a grade from your lab instructor, and so they're a little bit more formal, but I wanna make sure you all have informal peer evaluations as well. I think sometimes it's hard to take criticism from somebody who's an authority figure, somebody who has the power over the red pen in the grade book. I don't like that having, having that as your only feedback. I think it's helpful if you all get feedback from each other as well and you can kind of triangulate, okay, if all four of these people said this about my speech, maybe I need to rethink that part of my speech. So those are some useful exercises to help you all become better speakers. They're built into your major speeches for this class. I want you to get comfortable listening, not just for the sake of hearing other people's speeches, but really for thinking about how you'll give better ones as well. I'll tell you that I've been doing self and peer evaluations for a very long time. I'll also tell you that some of my students in the past have not taken them all that seriously and I think that's a mistake on their part. I think it's rather unfortunate. So I'll tell you that I had a speech a few years ago that I graded and it was an organizational nightmare. I could maybe tell after watching it seven or eight times what the speaker was trying to say. I could kind of pick out a thesis if I really squinted at it and tried to figure out what they wanted the main goal of their speech to be. The main points had no relation to one another. There were no transitions. It was kind of just a mess. It was kind of like word vomiting their entire speech. And I thought I was going crazy and I watched this speech when I was grading it like seven or eight times. So you can imagine if it was a five minute speech, I gave up about a half hour of my time just watching the speech, trying to make sense of it. 
And I decided it was probably good not to just rest on my own judgment, and so I turned to peer evaluations that I received from that student's classmates. And they said things like, I had no idea what the speaker was talking about. Now my peer evaluation at the time had a, a question at the bottom that said, what grade would you give this speaker based on that evaluation? And the sheet that I had, I would cut up that uh, bottom question and I would keep that for myself, and it was just for my own knowledge and to see how well my students were evaluating each other. I wouldn't share that information with the student, but I ended up with a student who said, I couldn't make any sense of the speech. I had no idea what the speaker was talking about. If that's the case, give me a one, two, three, four, or five, A, B, C, D, or E, what grade do you think you would give? I had no idea what the speaker was talking about. Is it a B, is it a D? Go ahead and raise your hands. Seeing some fours, some fives, a couple threes, so maybe some Cs. Most of us are in agreement that if we have no idea what the speech is about, the highest grade is maybe a C. C is average. C is meeting the bare minimum expectations of the assignment. I think C is probably even a little bit inflated. One of the things that I see when I do this kind of exercise is, especially on the first speech, a lot of people will see a terrible speech and will give it a good grade. And I know how undergrads' brains work. I was an undergrad not that long ago. They think, okay, well, if this was the worst speech I've ever seen and I give it a B minus, then I just have to do better than that and I'm looking at maybe a B plus or even an A. So I'll tell you that this student said they had no idea what this speech was about and they gave it a B minus and I gave that student who gave the peer eval a talking to about, you know, maybe you want to rethink your standards for evaluation. Now every semester, the first peer eval round is usually a little bit too nice. The second and third peer eval rounds are usually a little too mean. And so I want to encourage you all to try and be as honest as possible and to try and think holistically about the speech. What grade do you think it deserves and why? And really be honest with yourself and with the person you're evaluating for that. I also had a student who probably thought they were being funny and I would ask them to do self-evaluations and they'd write maybe one comment under each question, maybe a word or two under each question. It was very clear they weren't taking the evaluation seriously. My sense is that they didn't watch their speech when they were giving it. So the whole point of self-evaluation is that you actually watch your speech and learn some things that you didn't know that you were doing. And every single time the student turned in a self-evaluation, I asked them, what are some things that you would do differently the next time around? And they said, I didn't really prepare for this speech and I'm probably not going to for the next speech. And let me tell you, I wrote comments on their self-eval that they probably never read. And every single speech, it was very clear to me that they took that seriously. They didn't really prepare for the first one, or the second one, or the third one, or in that case, we had a fourth one. That student didn't pass the class. So you want to take these things seriously. They're not just mindless exercises that I'm asking you to check off a box on. They're designed to help you become better speakers. My dissertation advisor used to say that if students come out of a class the same way that they were when they came into a class, that they haven't really learned anything. She also used to say that sometimes when it comes to grading, people have to fail in order to give the system some kind of integrity. I don't like failing students on speeches. I don't like failing students in this class, but sometimes we need to have a system. We can't just give everybody a C or higher. It's important for us to take seriously the evaluation process, even though being evaluated isn't always the best feeling. So I'm gonna ask you as a class, raise your hand if you think you know something that would constitute effective feedback. Think about if you were receiving feedback on your speech, let's say you got a speech back from your instructor and you really wanted an A or an A minus, you thought you put the best energy into your speech and let's say you got a B. How would it be helpful for either your instructor or your classmates to share that information with you? What are some things that they could put in their written comments to you that would or would not be helpful? Can you think of anything? Yeah. Okay, good. So you, you call it roses and thorns. That's one thing you did really well and one thing that you can work on. In my first job, I worked as a writing center consultant and my boss would have us give feedback to students and they didn't call it roses and thorns, but it's a similar idea. They called it sandwich feedback. That is, you start off with something positive, you say a couple things that the speaker did well, then you say some things that the speaker could work on, maybe some things that didn't go so well, but then you end it back on something positive again. You either end it on more praise of things they did do well and reminders, hey, this wasn't that bad, or sometimes you can say, for your next speech, here are some other things that I would recommend. 
That's good. What else might be helpful in terms of how people would word their comments to you? What would you be looking for in that feedback? Or maybe start with the opposite. What are some things that wouldn't be so helpful? Good, yes, yeah, so you want to focus on conscious choices that the speaker had, how they chose to do what they did, whether those choices were or were not effective. You don't want to comment on the content of their speech unless that's relevant. You want to comment on the speaker and the choices that the speaker was making and things that are, are or are not in their control. What else? Yeah, good. Being as specific as possible. I like the way you worded that. Not just this sucked, but this sucked because you didn't do, uh, you didn't arrange it well. Your, uh, this sucked because your delivery was flat. Whatever it is, you want to be as specific as possible. Obviously, you probably don't want to use that exact language of this sucked, but you probably want to be very clear about things. You don't want to just say, that was amazing, great job. That's not really helpful feedback either. You want to be specific. You want to ground your criteria in something all of you will have a rubric for how you're being graded. You'd probably want to ground your comments to that person in that rubric. In this speech, you did really well on A, B, C, D, and E. In this speech, you can work on F and G. Next time around, here's what you can do. I've been on this kick for about a year now about giving feedback, and you'll see this reflected in the surveys I'm sending out to you all. I want you to be thinking about things that are or are not in that speaker's control. So I'll tell you that uh, a few years ago, I had a student with a really bad stutter. And he would get uh, distracted. He would sometimes forget to breathe. And he would stutter a whole bunch. And he came to me at the beginning of the semester and asked me if that was going to affect his grade. And I said, that's not something that you can control. I want to make sure that you give the best speech that you can. And even if you do happen to stutter, I want you to be confident that you can still give a good speech. So I'm not going to look at your stuttering. I'm going to look at your content. And that's what I did. I also have students who say, well, I'm just naturally put my hands in my pockets all the time. I can't not do that. I'm going to try and train you to break those bad habits. You can break a habit like that. It's hard to do. I told you all about crossing my arms. That's a habit that I've picked up. What that I'm trying to break. I want to make sure that you do that well. I just dropped my mic. Great. So uh, things that are or are not in that person's control. You also want to be mindful of things that are or are not helpful to that speaker. So again, being clear being specific, phrasing your criticism when you have constructive criticism in a way that is not too hurtful, being, uh, giving particular guidance for what that speaker can do the next time around. When I think of peer and self-evaluations, and I would imagine your instructors have the same thoughts about them, there's a couple of things that we want you to do. The first is really to substantively engage with the speech. So you're not just watching the speech, watching it on double speed, writing three things and being done with it to check off an assignment. But you're really trying to take that speech seriously, trying to listen very carefully to what the speaker said or what the speaker didn't say, trying to be engaged in your feedback as well, trying to be holistic, trying to be clear, trying to give details. The second thing is to really try to be as honest as possible. There's a little bit of a culture here that says if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. But sometimes when it comes to speech, we need to know some of those things that we're doing that are distracting or things that we could be doing better. The whole goal of this class is so that you all come in with a particular standard of how you speak now, and at the end of the semester, that standard is higher. You learn to speak a little bit better. That's going to come from honest peer evaluation feedback. If people aren't being honest with you, if they're not telling you things that you need to hear, that's going to be a problem. So you can say things that are constructive criticism, you want to think about how you say those things so that they're kind and generous and how you say them. But you want to make sure that you're saying everything that you can say about that speech that would be relevant to that speaker. The third thing is you want to try and be as accurate as possible when you're giving feedback. You want to ground your critique in things that you can observe in the video. So not just saying, I love that joke that you told, you get an A. But instead saying, at minute three, you did this, and I thought that was really effective. At three minutes and 20 seconds, you did this other thing, and I found that distracting. At four minutes, you recovered again, and that was good. You want to try and be pinpointing as specifically as possible what you can do. 
you also want to be reflexive in your feedback. That is, you want to think about if you were on the receiving end of this feedback, how would you hear it? So you want to think critically about the order in which you give your comments. You want to think about the wording of your comments. If you think about the five canons, arrangement and style really matter there. Last but not least, remember that I'm having you do these things as an exercise in learning. As people giving speech criticism, you should learn something by watching other people speak. As people receiving speech criticism, you also want to learn how to speak better. The goal here is to come out better all around, and so it's all about learning and growing. I want you to learn things from how you give and receive feedback. I also want you to learn how to receive feedback well. That is a skill that will serve you well regardless of whether you're in a public speaking classroom. A lot of people do not take criticism well. You want to separate out speech criticism from the speech of, with uh, speech criticism of you as the speaker. Yes, there are some things that are inherently involved. Speech is very personal, but recognize that they're not critiquing you as a person, or at least they shouldn't be, and if they are, you probably don't want to listen to it. But also learn that they're trying to help you improve your public speaking. So you want to be graceful in how you receive that feedback as well. Now before we go, I want you to have an opportunity to engage in some speech criticism today. So we're going to watch a sample speech. This is a sample in informative speech from the University of Wisconsin. It's a little bit of an old speech at this point, but it's helpful for figuring out speech criticism. The speaker happens to be talking about something that I find interesting. Some of you may not, but I happen to like spicy food and he chose to give his informative speech about the history of chili peppers. So we're gonna watch a version of his speech and I want you to think of how you would give feedback to this student, what kinds of things you would say, and then ultimately what grade you would give him. So again, I'm gonna have you do one, two, three, four, five, A, B, C, D, or F. So we'll go ahead and watch his speech. We'll see what we think of it. chili pepper that I cut in half, I know it's kind of small, you can't see it, but there are these uh, veins and seeds in there, and that's where the capsaic capsaicin is held, um, it's where all the heat is. As one of the books I read said, there are two ways to measure the heat of the chili pepper. The HPLC method is more scientific, so scientists prefer to use it. The, this guy that I held up um, is an orange habanero. using pepper spray. The spray burns the eyes and skin and gives you enough time to escape. According to Dak Collins, chili peppers also have lots of medical benefits. <coughs> They're used to reduce arthritis pain, help with indigestion, and cure baldness. Um, well, I guess that's all I have to say about chili peppers. Could you imagine life without chili peppers? I know I All right, take a second to digest that one. What do you think? If you were giving him feedback, what is something you would say? Actually, before we do that, give me on your fingers A, B, C, D, or F. What grade do you think you would give him? Seeing lots of threes, fours, fives. 
two, a lot of threes, okay? We'll talk about that. Tell me why you gave him the grade that you did. What are some comments you would give this student about his speech? Uh, it didn't seem like he was fully prepared. Okay, say more about that. Why not? He used an up kept basement. Um, his note cards, he kept kind of shuffling through. Yeah. Pause his speech whenever he was trying to look back at what he should say next. Yeah. The kind of thing is that his slideshow looking was kind of distracting. Okay. Yeah, so the main thing I hear you saying is he probably could have used more work on memory and delivery. Uh, he didn't seem all that well prepared. There was a lot of note cards. He probably should have had maybe two or three note cards for a speech like that. He had probably eight. I didn't count. But he had a bunch of them, and at one point he was shuffling through them because he was on the wrong one. When you all make your note cards, I'd encourage you to use the front side only of your note cards. A lot of people will write on the front and back, and they'll go to flip them over, and they'll drop them on the floor. It's also very easy if you have you know, 10 or 11 note cards, if you have way too many note cards, to put them in the wrong order before you speak, and then you're trying to figure out which note you're on. I think that's what happened to him. He had a lot of unplanned pauses. He didn't seem all that confident in himself. So memory and delivery probably weren't so good here. What else can we say about it? Yeah? His information wasn't very developed. Okay, his information wasn't very developed. Can you say more about that? Um, well, when he said he wanted to use milk, which he put in his book, he didn't really say why. Uh-huh. Yeah, so in terms of invention, he probably could have been a little bit more specific with his information. He cited a couple of his sources, but he didn't tell you who those people were or why they were qualified to talk about that. Uh, he threw in some random information that didn't seem all that relevant, so maybe invention could use a little work as well. What else did you notice? Yeah. Okay. Say more. Yeah, he wasn't very clear on where he got his information from or how he knows he can trust it. When I teach my students to do what I call signal phrases, it's usually the author's name, his, her, or their credentials, that is, who they are and why they're qualified to talk about this thing, some version of the word says, argues, asserts, something like that, and then the quotation or paraphrase. So you want to make sure that you're giving enough information to show how you know you can trust that source. I am glad that he did at least cite his sources most of the time, so that's probably a good thing. A lot of students forget to do that. That's a big problem. Other observations you all had? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Good. Yeah, so a lot of things with his delivery. He was a little too dependent on his note cards. He had a lot of unplanned pauses and hesitations, some upward inflections that sound like he's asking a question rather than making a statement, uh, pretty poor eye contact, things like that. Any other observations you could make about this speech? What do you think of the arrangement? Was it clear? Was it effective? I'm seeing some people shaking their heads no. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, so the intro was okay. There were some parts that were missing from the intro. The conclusion was basically nothing. Well, I guess that's all I have. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed it. You don't want that kind of a conclusion. He had a lot of ideas packed into like a two and a half minute speech. And so there was a lot of what I called breadth. That is, there's a lot of things happening. It's like seven or eight different ideas in a two minute speech. Breadth is going this way, depth is going this way. That is, how much do you talk about each topic? We talked about this in terms of balance. His speech is way off balance because he spends like two sentences on each idea that he has. There's no transitions between or among them. It's a little bit jumbled. It's a little bit hard to follow. Are there positive redeeming factors that you see in this speech? We jumped on him. We laid on all the criticism in the negative sense. Is there anything that's positive or redeeming about them? Yeah. Okay, so maybe in terms of his vocal delivery or verbal delivery, he was speaking at a good volume. He had somewhat of a good rhythm when he wasn't worrying about what he was going to say next. There was some effort to engage the audience there. So maybe that's some positive comment. Yeah? 
Okay, he had a visual aid. I'm glad that he, able, he was able to have a visual aid. His visual aids were not particularly good. My students yesterday pointed out there was a map that took up like a quarter of the screen over here and he left the rest of the screen blank. He had a chili pepper that he had cut in half and it was a small chili pepper to begin with. And then he's like, here, I know you can't see this, but this is a chili pepper. So his visual aids weren't the greatest, but at least he had practiced with them somewhat. He was able to use them. Other positive redeeming factors? It's a little hard, right? <laughs> We're not really sure what was so good about the speech. One more. Okay, so he kept his feet planted. One of the things that can be really distracting is if you're walking around and pacing the whole time. I had a student scream his speech while pacing back and forth like a railroad. That was a little crazy. So he was able to at least have fairly confident posture and kept his feet planted. His energy was mostly in his upper body where it should have been. So there were a couple of redeeming factors. I'm going to ask you all again, one, two, three, four, five, A, B, C, D, or E, or A, A, B, C, D, or F, what grade would you give him? Would you keep the same grade? I'm seeing some twos, I'm seeing fours, threes. I should be seeing more fours and fives. Again, I know how your brains work. You think, okay, if he gets a C, then I just have to do better than him, and I should get better than a C. It doesn't work like that. I'll tell you that if I were grading this speech, it would probably be at best a D minus. I might even consider failing him. I don't say that to scare you, although I do say that to scare you a little bit. I'm here to tell you that I want you all to have higher standards for your own speeches. I don't want you to just get by with the bare minimum. A lot of you will have the same bad habits that you've had your whole lives if you do that. I want you to strive to do better than that. There's another version of this speech that is a much better cleaned up, revised version based on a lot of the comments that you all gave. Remember, if you think I'm being too harsh there, you all struggled to come up with anything redeeming about this speech. It took you a while to figure out what to say that was good about it. So learn from, the, learn from this speech. One of the best ways you can learn to become better speakers is by learning some of the things you want to avoid and what not to do. I told you all that I have this version of this speech and a better version of this speech. I'll make the better version available to you on Blackboard. That one I would say is probably an A or an A minus version of the same speech. You all should watch it and learn a little bit about your own speeches and then think about how you're going to be giving your own speeches in the next week or two. I'll see you all next week. <laughs>